Deathbringer here. Subscribe so you never miss an upload. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master. And on this channel, I cover everything about role-playing games. And today, we're taking a look at So You Want to Be a Game Master by Justin Alexander. Full disclosure, I was not sent a review copy. I don't know Mr. Alexander. I'm just a fan who ordered the book on Amazon. And for those of you who just fast forward till the end, I'm going to say it right now. I think this is one of the best books on role-playing games ever written. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced game master or a new game master just starting out. This book is a must-have. Let's take a look. So you want to be a game master. Everything you need to start your tabletop adventure for Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, and other systems by Justin Alexander. This book is 560 pages. It features blurbs on the back by Monty Cook and Matt Coville. Matt wishes he had this book at 15, and so do I. Justin Alexander runs the Alexandrian website, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a must for any serious game master. And this book is filled with information. Let's take a look from the beginning. A table of contents. We got Dungeons, Mysteries, Raids and Heights, Urban Adventures, Into the Wild, and Extra Credit. The introduction begins with an example of play that tells you what the Dungeon Master is doing. One of the great things about this book is it is system agnostic, so all the information you see is not about stat blocks, which I think is a major stumbling point for new game masters. They're very concerned about stat blocks, but to me, stat blocks just tell you how hard a monster is to hit, how they cause damage, how much damage they do, and how long before they die. I think the philosophy of game design is more important or as important as the mechanics itself. So that's one of the great things about this book. It starts with dungeons and how to design them and how the dice work. And one of the most brilliant parts of the book is right here, the ruling. You know, we say rulings, not rules, but what does that mean? Alexander makes a really radical suggestion here, which is default to yes. As game masters, we frequently default to no, you can't do that. You can't jump the chasm. Or second, make a check to see if you could jump the chasm. Alexander suggests default to yes. The player wants to jump the chasm. The DM says, okay, you're on the other side. What do you do now? And it's a psychological mind shift for a game master that helps the game master remain positive and move the game forward. I find a problem, especially with newer game masters or less experienced game masters, is they ask for a check for everything when it's just not needed. And he calls this advice the dungeon master's secret weapon. When in doubt, say yes. That happens. And that's a way to keep the momentum of your game always moving forward. How to run a room, and then how to run a dungeon. How to design a dungeon. What a dungeon should look like. Hooks, themes, corridors, different types of rooms. How to keep track of things in the dungeon. What's the marching order? How much time is passing? Do your players have torches? Do they have fuel? What's the chance of an encounter occurring? How to run encounters, making monsters unique. What are the monsters doing? Are they a working guard patrol? Are they escorting prisoners? Are they performing a ritual? Tips to make a dungeon seem like a real active location. Using distances, running traps, challenge ratings, how to use them. When you design encounters, you want to combine elements. You don't want to just have one monster in a room. You want to try to combine them, like goblins and ogres, and goblins and tieflings, and goblins and owl bears. The concept of the 5 plus 5 dungeon, where you have five different types of featured rooms. A challenge, a fight, a twist, a reward, and a second challenge fight, twist, or reward. Dynamic encounter design, which is based on, again, combining encounters. You don't want an encounter with just one big bad guy because the players are just gonna swarm them. It's better to have encounters with lots of opponents in order to provide tactical complexity. Fascinating insight here. Some RPGs are not designed for strategic-based play and therefore struggle with dynamic encounter design. These are sometimes referred to as tactics-based or tactical RPGs. And you can usually identify them because they provide mechanics that trivially allow PCs to restore their resources at the end of each fight. The fourth edition of D&D, unlike other versions of the game, was designed like this. The problem is that without strategic ablation of resources, encounters that don't carry some significant risk of wiping out the PCs becomes meaningless since any losses incurred will just reset when the encounter is finished. If you're running a tactical RPG, you won't be able to use dynamic dungeons. Instead, 
you have to focus on precious encounter design in which enemies and terrain are carefully designed in static prefabricated packages to create maximum tactical interest. This really stresses the difference between older editions of Dungeons and Dragons and newer ones. Alexander doesn't mention 5e by name, but that's one of my problems with short rests. It essentially allows the players to recover half their hit points. And there are a lot of spells like Goodberry that allow them to bypass resource management. Part two, how to run a mystery, including how to eliminate empty time, which I call shoe leather in a recent episode. The players want to speak to Lady Isabella, cut to, you're in Lady Isabella's study. Or you can abstract time. You leave the Hogshead Tavern and head up to the Noble Districts after a brief and somewhat rancorous exchange with the doorman at the Corvier Estate you're ushered into Lady Isabella's private study. This is great advice on keeping your game moving. The three clue rule. When you're running a mystery, you always give the players three clues for every conclusion you want them to make because they're not Sherlock Holmes and RPG mysteries just don't work that way. No design or what Tracy Hickman calls matrix design where A leads to B, leads to C, and players can make meaningful choices. They're gonna start at the same point, but they can have three different conclusions. Or the scenario can provide multiple pathways to the same ending. How to run raids, how to run heists. This is a topic that I'm frequently asked about. How to run a city adventure. Having run a campaign for almost 30 years, primarily set in a city, I can tell you this is great advice for organizing adventure sites, encounters, making the city come to life, what the characters do in their downtime, urban crawls, and social events. Someone asked on my Twitter feed recently about what's the game with the best mechanics for social encounters, and I said, if you want to encourage social encounters, don't have mechanics that govern social encounters. Alexander shows you how to run the event with meaningful choices and not hinge it on game mechanics like a failed charisma check. How to run hex crawls. How to handle overland travel. Tools for running hex crawl encounters. How to run an open table. How to build your world on the fly. Design rumor tables. Practical advice like rolling initiative last. This is brilliant. D&D &D and many RPGs tell you that one, combat begins. Two, you roll initiative. But this doesn't produce optimal results. He suggests rolling initiative first for the next encounter. That way, instead of eight goblins drop down on you, let's wait three minutes while we all shuffle numbers around. It's eight goblins drop out of the jungle canopy. Reinhardt, what do you do? That is brilliant. I hate rolling for individual initiative. It slows down the game just when the game should be speeding up. And for those of you that say, no, it doesn't take that long, next time you roll initiative, hit a stopwatch and see how long it takes. Because I've watched Critical Roll and it takes them literally three minutes just just to figure out who's going first. How to put the players on deck so they move their turns along. It doesn't take 10 minutes to get around the table. Random name charts and one of my favorite sections on splitting the party. How do you do that successfully and still keep the game focused and moving along? When I do reviews, I always get someone in the comments section saying I'm too positive. I never point out the negative. The only negative thing I could think of is this book is it's so thick, you really can't fit it in your pocket. But it is brilliant advice. Every page is filled with useful information. Over the years, I've read a lot of books on how to be a game master, but I don't think any are as comprehensive. I especially enjoy Mr. Alexander's super positive tone. He's always saying being the game master is the easiest job at the table. You can do it. I'll show you how. So he's always encouraging. And as a teacher, I really appreciate the way the book is structured. The first third is about designing a dungeon, and then it's like, after you've done that for a while, come back and read the second half of the book. I love that idea that you learn the basics and then you layer in other skills. So many young new game masters come to me to ask me what I think of their campaign ideas, and it's like, I'm starting the players at 10th level, and they're pirates, and they're sailing to all these different continents, and it's going to end with an epic confrontation between a Kraken and Great Cthulhu, and it creates a tsunami, and the PCs have to stop it before it wipes out the kingdom, and it's like, whoa, whoa there, slow down, maybe you should design like a room and a couple of dungeons first. Oftentimes when we get role-playing games, especially when we're young, we, we get really excited about the potential of all the things that we could do, and we don't take our time. I remember thinking that as well when I was a kid, like, I can't wait to get characters to 10th level, and then we're really going to have fun. And what I discovered along the way is actually low to mid-level play is a lot more fun. The dungeon environment is a vital training ground for new game masters, because 
It provides characters with limited choices, but significant choices, and they don't have game-breaking powers. That's where you cut your teeth in the dungeon, and after you've mastered the basic skills, you could branch out and run different types of adventures. If you're an experienced game master like me, you're still gonna find information that's gonna be useful to you. I found the first rule, just say yes, to be an incredible mind shift for me. I generally do that, but this really explains why you should do it. Other concepts like combining enemies for an epic conclusion were the three clue rule it took me decades to figure these things out for myself. Reading this book is a lot more enjoyable and fun. And combined with the Lazy Dungeon Master, it makes an incredible cornerstone for any GM's library. At least that's what I think. What do you think? Share in the comments below. Also below, you'll find links to my own game, Deathbringer, as well as Dungeon Craft Patreon, where you can get extended video content and help support this channel. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you soon. May all your rolls be 20s.